Welcome to the Content Strategy Interviews Podcast. Each week, we talk with accomplished content strategy experts to share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 21 of the Content Strategy Interviews Podcast. I've got with us today Todd Bishop. He's the co-founder of GeekWire, a tech publication that's, um, I don't know exactly how you phrase it, but it's its kind of local to Seattle, but it's really a nationally known tech publication. So let me have Todd talk a little bit more about GeekWire and what he does there, and uh, we'll go from there. Sounds great. Yes. So I'm the editor and co-founder at GeekWire. Uh, my colleague John Cook and I were longtime newspaper reporters, so we tend to view the world of content through that lens with a bunch of a, a bit of a modern twist, obviously, based on what we're doing now. You're, you're exactly right, and people do struggle with exactly how to, to define us, but what, what we like to say is that uh, we are a national and international technology news site that look at the world of technology, that looks at the world of technology through the lens of the Pacific Northwest. So we are not okay. merely writing for people here, although we are based here and a lot of the content that we write is relevant here. It resonates around the world really because of all of the stuff that's happening here. We well, have yeah, people kind of pay attention to Amazon and Microsoft yep. and Facebook and Google and those people who are here. Um, and tell me a little bit about the, I know the basic story, like 2011, I think you, you had both left, uh, the, were you both at the PI at the we same were. time? Yeah, John and I yeah. were at the PI and uh, we went through a, a couple variations of what we're doing now, but it, we founded GeekWire in 2011. Uh, and uh, worked with an angel investor named Jonathan Sposato, who is our chairman still and uh, is uh, our sole outside investor. Uh, and uh, we basically started this as a startup of our own after covering tech startups for quite a while. Well, that's you know, I did, this isn't really a podcast about startups, right. but that is intriguing to me that um, you just have one event and that you are some you've got what 15 people working here and you're going right. gangbusters. You have all these events and things going on and with just one investor. So you're doing you're doing well. You've figured out a way to make money with content. Well, essentially, yes, we've bootstrapped the company from that initial investment, not taken any other outside investment and we're profitable and we just have essentially grown based on the results of the business. And as we've had money to grow, we've grown a little bit more and seen mm -hmm. what we could do with that. And um, a big portion of our business is events. You've alluded to this. We run anywhere between 10 to 13, 14 events of varying size throughout the year. And we generate revenue through those from event sponsorships and ticket sales. And uh, But we also do make money purely off of content through online advertising and sponsored content on the business side. We keep that traditional newspaper style advertising editorial divide still, uh, and but, but we do a, a range of advertising and sponsored content on the business side. Right. So you're, and you've been, so many people struggle with that and you are thriving in that. I, do you attribute that to the, just, we've got a nice vibrant tech environment here. You're probably doing as, as, as sellable a kind of content as anybody, I'm going to guess. Or is that it? Or is it the, the event stuff? I just wonder it's, how much of the, the it, event stuff. It, it all comes down to the content as the starting point because the way we have remained relevant is we are hopefully in an ideal world breaking news every day or reporting news and insight that people need to read uh, essentially they would read us for business insights tips people read us for all sorts of reasons they're recruiting they're looking for a job you know i think as and that, that, just to get into the content discussion a little bit the yeah. um I think reporters traditionally think of the, the stuff that they write as changing the world. And in a lot of ways it does. There's changing the world in the ways of the Pentagon Papers and Watergate, and there's changing the world in the ways of helping somebody learn about a company they didn't know about that they might want to work at. Um, there's helping a company find their next big hire. There's helping a salesperson find their uh, next big client. And it's interesting, we try to clearly break news that is on the level of you know something that could win a Pulitzer. I mean, I would love it someday if GeekWire won a Pulitzer. At the same time, 
we also have to provide value in a very practical way to people who are just trying to improve their lives and do better in their jobs. Right. And people, that's always been a role of business journalism. Absolutely. It's like being out there at the forefront and, and keeping people informed. Um, yeah, I'd love to see you guys win a Pulitzer. Wouldn't that I, be great? I, I loved when you broke that story a while back, The um, when you found the drone test site in <laughs> Carnation or something. Yes, that was great. We used yeah. uh, Google satellite maps to identify Amazon's secret drone location. And, you know, we've done some other reporting. There was a site called Order Ahead that was doing this big restaurant scam, basically. And we exposed it, and Google ended up changing their search algorithm uh, to push down all these sort of fake order-ahead sites that were becoming this sort of forced intermediary for local restaurants. So, you know, we definitely do try to do that civic level of journalism, and that's a big mix of what we do. But we also... I think recognize that there are practical ways that people are using right. info. That's great to hear because one of the things that I just worry about a lot in the state of journalism currently is the de the demise of enterprise journalism oh, yeah. and, and 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 in depth uh, reporting on you know kind of investigative stuff. And you guys are actually doing that, so that's great. Yeah. Well, I guess and let me so that kind of like I, to bring it back to content and content strategy, I think so many content, you know, content strategy, I think has emerged as an interesting field because enterprises need it now. Everybody's a publisher. You know, there's still PR, people are getting their earned media, they're buying advertising, but the, the big goal now and is the, this idea of content marketing that everybody wants to be a publisher ex to establish their expertise in their field. And that's how they start their sales cycle and, and engage their customers. Um, and they all struggle with like having something to say and getting their content together and putting a lot together. When we were anyhow, like I told you just before we started that my, my working hypothesis about journalists and journalism business is that when it comes to content strategy, you're so immersed in it that like, it's like talking to a fish about water, you know? Um, but you've thought about it. You sure. tell me, tell me, because obviously when you talked about how the events tie in with what you sure. do and the other stuff that you're doing, it's all about content. Uh, did you consciously take a strategic approach to the, like the, the beats that you want to cover the, 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 yeah, in some ways, in some ways we did. Um, it, it's more, though, about what we know is important here. It, 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 to us, it's just, it's all very natural. I think your fish in water analogy is, is very apt. Um, this is the, a place in the world where there, there is just fascinating stuff happening. You mentioned Amazon. Microsoft has a resurgence. One of the places where we've really seen a big uptick in readership lately is in space and science coverage. You've got Blue Origin here. You've got SpaceX with a big presence out in Redmond. You've got all sorts of interesting space companies here based on the aerospace heritage coming out of Boeing. And we've got one of the best space and science reporters in the country, Alan Boyle. And so we have really just kind of followed the lead of what's important here and looked for things that are not only important here, but that resonate nationally and internationally. And we kind of stumbled onto that with the Microsoft and Amazon model, where it's like, oh, wow, look at this. This is really, really local stuff. There is one Amazon story that we picked up because we were looking at the permit filings for a former restaurant in the Ballard neighborhood in Seattle, and that was the Amazon fresh pickup story. We broke that story. We were all over it. It was here. It was very local, like the Ballard... Uh, the Ballard blog uh, covered it, but yeah. we were getting pick up around the world. So I, to, to answer your question directly, I think it's just it, it's just following that model and following what's important to us. And yes, it does really help the events business because it creates a critical mass of readers here. So you should know that just as a basic, about 15 to 20 percent of our readership, depending on how you count it, is Washington State. So it's our largest market, but it's nowhere near the majority of our traffic. That surprises a lot of people who are in Seattle. It doesn't surprise people who are outside of Seattle. There are people who come in and read our site. They have no idea that we're based here. And they're coming in to a story page from Twitter, and it's just a different identity to them. It's just a site that happens to have an interesting story they want to read on Amazon. Right. Well, that kind of gets into the whole overarching business strategy. Like you picked your brand name, GeekWire. It doesn't have anything. Like I think of like Art Teal Sports Press Northwest, that very regional and specifically. You knew you were going to be regional, but did you, you had an inkling that this was going to be bigger than... Oh, yeah. And this was basically our third incarnation of trying something like this, if you date, go back to the PI. Um, so we had a sense for the power of that model of focusing on things here that resonate everywhere. Gotcha. And um, so that and so that's there's that sort of um, 
that you you had a sense of your readers. You had tried a couple things elsewhere before. That's 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 a good foundation for your strategy. And tell me how the like. So you talked about how the content drives everything. The event stuff. The obviously the 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 journalism. And it's pretty. I'm not going to say conventional, but it's like it's kind of like what journalists used to do. Like places like the Seattle Times and other big media outlets are struggling. Their newsrooms are half the size they used to be, and um, uh, they aren't able to break those stories. Is it is part of your strategy focus by being focused relentlessly on the business stuff? That yeah, it's well. I think first off, we're focusing primarily on the, the the audience on the editorial side, and I'm struggling to answer that question because I think we look at it differently on the two sides of the business: the business side and the and the editorial side. Uh, from the from an editorial perspective, I mean, I am just trying to f- help our reporters find the most interesting, relevant, uh, cutting edge content they can find, the things that our readers really want to know about now. In the back of my mind, I do know, okay, that is not only important to our readers, it's important to the business. It's, it's very complementary in terms of the two strategies. And so I'm in an interesting spot where I do help formulate the overall direction of the business, even though I'm not involved directly in any kind of sales or advertising, that sort of thing. So like for our events, for example, I'm very heavily involved in finding speakers, getting folks on stage. But we even do the editorial advertising divide there where you can't buy a spot on the main stage as a speaker you know so we it's it's a, a fine line between all this stuff and and uh, it's the kind of thing where we just try and maintain that that divide but um are they similar divides in the because yeah. that old news because i think i do a lot of event stuff myself yeah. and wrestle in various worlds with with that you know People, a lot of sponsors expect to buy a spot on the. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They're they're similar for us. For the outside world, they're not. I think it's a bit of a shock to some sponsors when they find that they can't buy that spot on the main stage. Now, what we have done is we've created lunch sponsored sessions where it's off stage and they can go over there. And and frankly, some of those in terms of content, uh, we've gotten in some of the reader surveys or the event attendee surveys we've done, like some of those are some of the highest rated <laughs> in terms of the the actual uh, attendee experience, the sponsored well, that's sessions. A, yeah, That's interesting to me because I think, I don't know, I don't have data on this, but my hunch is that something like 70 or 80% of the people who identify as content strategists are content marketing strategists. Interesting. And they're figuring out, and they're the ones, they're those guys. They're the guys who are figuring out how to do excellent programming at your conference to like get people's attention. You know, they're yep. doing it with they're doing it authentically and transparently and in a way that engages people. Uh, is that am I being accurate there? Does that Absolutely. is that how they get the attention of Absolutely. Yeah. And in those cases it was people who sponsored who were talking about topics that were really, really relevant to our audience. They knew they, they had done it purposely. Okay, we have this message, we want to get it out to this type of audience. Wow, look at this event. Let's let's talk to them. And yeah. uh, so it it's just it's just about looking for on that business side. I think it's the folks who look for that kind of complimentary approach. Yeah. That no, that's really them. super. Cause I go back, I come from a journalistic yeah. family and, you know, and, and just have this heritage of like, my mother was just adamant about the Chinese wall between yep. the editorial and the business side, but you're in a business role. You're one of the co-founders and you're the editorial lead or a, yep. one of the two. And you're walking that line just fine. You've got, it sounds like I've never heard, any questions about your integrity or the, you know, the reputation. I mean, you guys are just nailing it somehow. In I, way. I mean, I, yeah. gosh, we're trying, we're doing our best. Yeah. And, um, I, I mean, I'd hate to hold my, hold ourselves out as paragons because I'm <laughs> yeah. sure there's times when it's, you know, and we, we've had, I'm sure to self-correct at times like, Oh, wait a second. No, that's not quite right. Let's, let's do it this way next time. And I, I can remember situations where that would happen, but in, in terms of the general principle, keeping the interests of our readers in mind, as the the focus of our editorial side, regardless of what happens. I mean, to be candid with you, I have lost us sponsors before on the editorial side based on things that I've written. And I know that because I've overheard it afterward, not because there was any kind of pressure in in advance or knowledge in advance based on what I was writing. Um, The business folks didn't know what I was writing and they would have just gotten the call afterwards saying, okay, well, that sponsorship, uh, we're not going to renew that one next time. Thanks. Well, that's interesting to me too. I wonder like, because you're old, 
not old school, but like you've been in journalism. You you go back to the to uh, you know. I, I wrote. For, there yeah. was a time when I was writing one story a day. Okay. <laughs> like I would get in in the morning at the newspaper, and I, my goal would be a, a five p.m. deadline. So I think that's old school. Yeah. No. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's kind of it. And well, that actually gets at something else I wanted to ask you about. And I almost think I'm uh, not that I want to make this like a public service thing for the rest of the content strategy industry, but one of the things that almost everybody struggles with at one level or another, like from independent website designers trying to get content out of their client up to like big enterprise things that they know what they need to do and they can't get the budget, you know, from the, from the, uh, the, the marketing or whoever the, the budget authority is. Um, pe people, but generically people struggle with content. And this is where I was talking about the fish in water thing. That's all you do. Ha have you found, um, as you, especially as you got more onto the business side of things, because you came out of a, you were strictly editorial up yep. until you started this. Right. Um, as you've gone into the business side, have you found um, ways to kind of to think about that the, your journalism craft and practice as sort of that's the content creation side of the business. It's it's both. Uh, it, it's it, that's what's interesting about journalism to me and, and publishing and, and other uh, uh, content creation businesses is that you don't have to, that's what you're doing. You're creating that. You're just, then you have to figure out how to sell the content. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess I'm wondering, like, as you've made that transition from pure, uh, journalist side to the, to the hybrid business side, have you had any insights about how you like leverage content for business purposes? I actually, I know this might be shocking, but I actually don't, think about it in that way. I, I and I don't want to, I, I think it's a great question. I wish I had a lot of insights on it. I am so, like, I'll give you an example. This past week we had two IPO filings, um, both a, com a company called uh, Smartsheet and a company uh, called DocuSign, yeah, out of the Seattle. And we were we, we just lit up because uh, IPO filing means you finally get to see the financials of this company that you've been following for years, but they're privately held. So you don't get to see how they're actually doing. I mean, honestly, that is the kind of stuff that drives us. It's, it's pretty, um, basic on the news side. Frankly, our readers really should know about this. We are really excited about figuring it out. We want to tell people what's going on. It finding that kind of, um, that, that story that nobody else knows about that you have figured out and you get to tell the world about it. Frankly, it's almost like it's just a natural thing that happens and it just happens to drive an audience. And, and so it works. And then the thing is then separately on the business side, figuring out what you can do with that audience. Now I will mm -hmm. say that the geographic mix is one area that we, we do think about. Um, and we want to make sure we have enough of a critical mass of readers still in the Seattle region that does drive the business. So if you think about it big and broad, we need to have enough people here that we can get people to our events. Right. That's it. And so, and so that is on the content side, we do think about that in terms mm -hmm. of there, ha there should be ultimately in most of our stories, uh, some sort of hook back to the Pacific Northwest, some sort of relevance here. And it's not that way in every story. And a lot of times it's indirect, but I'll give you an example. We do mm -hmm. not cover startups outside of the Pacific Northwest. We cover some big tech companies outside of the Pacific Northwest, but when it comes to startups, if there's a startup in New York that really has no relation to what's going on in here, we don't cover it. Gotcha. So that, that is no, probably the place. Well, that's it. So that's it. And that was, that was my, kind of my next question was the, the strategy that unites the event stuff and the content and the business goals. Like you were saying, your user needs, you have your, your customer, what they're expecting. And there it's mostly, there, there's still that expectation of that Northwest focus. And for you as a business, that's what, probably what drives the event attendance. And you do what, like 10 or 12 events yep. a year? The Gala, Yeah, they range the, from like yeah. parties, like the GeekWire Bash. We had 1,700 people out to play ping pong and foosball and dodgeball uh, to a very serious conference, the two-day GeekWire Summit. We had the CEOs of Starbucks and Boeing there as our headliners last year. And that uh, has really taken off in terms of an event. It's coming up this year again in October. And uh, so... The events really range the gamut. Now, they are in the Pacific Northwest for now. We've talked about doing events elsewhere, and we did a little bit of an experiment geographically. In February, we opened a temporary HQ2, as we called it, 
uh, in Pittsburgh just to see what it would be like to be in another market well, for I a loved, month. Yeah. I got to say, I love that because that was sort of, I gather it was sort of a tongue in cheek um, yeah. take on Amazon's quest for HQ2, but it was a genuine outreach yes. on your part to another tech community. And because when you were just saying that you don't cover specific startups in other places, but it sounds like you would cover like a startup, startup ecosystem, like oh, in sure. Pittsburgh or Austin or someplace. Right. And I guess Pittsburgh yeah. is the exception to the, to the rule that I just, <laughs> just gave because yeah. yeah, it was, it was, you're right. Both a tongue in cheek homage to Amazon's HQ2 search. We literally put out an RFP that spoofed theirs, and, but we actually got responses from 10 cities around the country, uh, everywhere from Philadelphia and, and Pittsburgh to Raleigh, North Carolina to Sacramento, California, you know, all over the place. And we picked Pittsburgh uh, after a basically a, a, a numerical and quantifiable selection process. Interesting. So what were your criteria? Oh, gosh, I'd have to go back and look. But uh, it was a few different things. The quality of the startup ecosystem, the uh, level of innovation coming out of the universities. We also did consider whether Amazon's HQ2 was at least a possibility there. And right. it was funny. Amazon made their they narrowed their list to 20 about a week before we were headed out to Pittsburgh. And we got word the night before that the, the short list was coming out. I don't think any of us got any sleep because if yeah. we had had to go to Pittsburgh and they weren't on the list, it would have it would have sucked. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. yeah. Yeah. Thank God they were on the yeah. list. Did you do any events while you were there? You know, we were did. You? We did some small scale events. Okay. Um, there was a venture capital firm there that uh, held an event for us. We did a closing event where the mayor of Pittsburgh spoke and talked about what he what he had learned from our coverage. It was it was frankly a remarkable experience. The real eye-opening thing for us, it gave us a huge appreciation for what we do back here in a couple different ways. First, going into a new market where you have zero reputation, zero institutional knowledge, and you have to prove yourself all over again, you do things that you used to do back in your original market. And part of our attempt now that we're back here to, to learn the lessons of Pittsburgh is doing some of those things, going to the communities that we should be visiting here in Seattle, for example. Um, and, and second, it was just fascinating because it is a smaller place. It, it really taught us the value of being in such a tech hotbed as Seattle. And I think to some extent, there's a chance we could have taken that for granted. I mean, this is an amazing spot. No, no it's not as big as Silicon Valley, but it's really, I, I still believe it's the number two tech market in the country. And, and it has, a, and, and in terms of enterprise technology and all sorts of other things, in many other ways, cloud technology, it's the top tech market in the country. Oh, absolutely. I, I heard this astonishing statistic the, about Amazon's market share of cloud services, mm -hmm. and it was ridiculous. Yeah, and, 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 on, and yeah. you've also got the number two player here in Microsoft and, and, Azure. Yeah. And increasingly, I mean, Google, the big campus they're building north of Amazon's actual headquarters is basically going to be Google Cloud. So... There's lots, of, and I know that has nothing to do yeah. with content strategy. <laughs> no, but but it's interesting. But it gets at like the content that you're, and this is where, yeah. and this kind of comes back to that fish and water idea that like that's what you swim in, and that's yes. what you, that's what you. Um, do you ever tell me when you step back to that ten thousand, yep. twenty thousand foot level? Uh, the, I assume that Pittsburgh came out of, the, or the or the, the the ultimate the the project that ended up in Pittsburgh was something like that, where you were like, what if? Or? Yeah. And, and this actually does get a lot into the content. And this is something that I really advise for everybody thinking about content, whether it's journalistic or not. We, we do something that we call, I like to call them, and I'm making everybody else call them, GeekWire Adventures. And they are things that we love to do. They're great team building exercises, but they're also great content and our readers love them. So a great example was a race that we did from Seattle's Fremont neighborhood to Pioneer Square, where one person was in a Reach Now uh, car sharing service, another person was on an electric bike, somebody was actually on an electric skateboard. I rode one of the uh, spin bike ride ride sharing things. Somebody else was, uh, you know, in an Uber. We basically raced. Another person took took the bus. It was a multimodal transportation race, and we had a blast doing it. And then we all wrote up our experiences and talked about the winner, and. It did so well on the site, and that is a, a real measure that I have in terms of what content is resonating beyond the actual numbers, right. when we, and which we watch closely. When we go out to an event the next week or the next night, or, or what, what do people say when we say, oh, I'm with GeekWire, 
usually somebody says, oh yeah, I saw that story. And what that story is that they bring up to you is very important because it means that's what's resonated with them. Now and this was one of those stories. That's interesting because that gets into um, what you, you said, you, your eyebrows kind of went up in you when you said, and we really pay attention that you really do measure carefully. Yeah. It sounds like, what, what are the key metrics for you? What do you and and I, I'm really interested from what you just said, like, how well does that sort of community interaction and, and, and sub, kind of subjective res, uh, uh, reaction that you hear out in the community, how does that line up with your web analytics and stuff like that? Yeah, it doesn't always. There, like, there are some times when the story yeah. that we love and that the people at the events we go to love, it's, it can be not one of the top stories on the site. But I think the race is a good example of something where it was really uh, something that did both well in terms of page views, users, time on site, bounce rate. In other words, a low bounce rate. Mm -hmm. uh, so people who read that story were engaged enough with it to read the next story and the next story on the site. Uh, so it doesn't always line up, but for the most part, those two things are pretty well aligned. If, if somebody's talking about it at, at an event, it accrues well to the brand in a variety of different ways. Got it. One thing you reminded me of um, an earlier interview we talked. I talked with um, Eric Enga at um, Stone Temple Consulting back east, and he talked about the difference between um, shareability, like uh, social media yes. kind of phenomenon among a piece of content, and then like a linkable one, like one that because he's very concerned with SEO and, and link development. Yeah. And um, so it's interesting. There's this other. So there's another. And this yours your observation more gets at like the the struggle that branding people have like how do you measure brand impression like yeah. what people think about us and you know from your interactions in the community that people think well of you and enjoy these things even if it doesn't show up in the yeah the and, metrics and they may not like every single story you know and in in some ways people not liking the story at times can be a good measure of the fact that you're doing your job as a journalist so that is one place where our roles as reporters actually differs from perhaps a business content marketing strategist strategist well, and that sort of now thing. Now that's interesting because is that, and this is, this is something different for you because that's like the old fourth estate, yep. you know, that you're like, that's your obligation, your duty to report regardless of the, you know, you might lose that source, you might lose that advertising yep. revenue. Uh, and you, you take that to heart. It sounds like. Absolutely. And there've been yeah. some, it's, it's, it can be very difficult. You can, but you have to have those difficult conversations as long as what we try to do is make sure that we're, transparent with the subject of the story about what we're doing, why we're asking it. There are no surprises when the story comes out, you know, Hey, here, not that we're, we're very careful. We don't share the details of what we write in advance, but through the questions that we ask, it should be obvious to them, the angle that we're taking, not, not a surprise to them. Right. And I'm not, the, the, when I say angle that we're taking, I mean the things that we're looking at, the things that we think are important about a particular story. And, um, it, yeah, there've been, very difficult situations involving some court cases, not against us, but where we've been covering court cases and we've found things out that people prominent in the community would rather not have seen published. And we published them and it, they were not happy with us. And it's just part of the job. No, that's, that's an interesting one. That's, uh, I think, um, uh, so many people involved in content strategy would have, like, they just never would touch that. No. It's, and, it, and it's, I'm, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and as I said earlier, I don't want to hold this up as some sort of paragon. Yeah. And you mentioned the Seattle times earlier and mm -hmm. you know, they, it, we competed against them when we were at the Seattle PI. I'm, I'm a reader and, and subscriber now. And, and I, I don't know. I just, I hope they continue to do well. I, I uh, and I, I think in a lot of ways, if you look at what they did with the mayor in Seattle last year and, and uncovered things that needed to be uncovered, I think I hope that there's more and more and more of these journalistic organizations that are out there serving that role. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because, yeah, just as a citizen, I worry yeah. about the demise of that. Hey, wanted to, I, we're, we're coming up on yeah. time. I noticed. Um, I wanted to give you one last chance. I ask this everyone this, Todd, at the, towards the end. Is there anything last, anything that while we're talking, while you have the ear of my audience that you'd like to talk about? You know, I, I really think that there's power in finding public information that's just there to be dug up and I, one thing we talk a lot about with our reporters is mastering FOIA requests and uh, Freedom of Information Act okay. requests and the ability to 
dig up information that really is sort of hiding in plain sight. And I think that there's a role uh, or a, a model to be followed there or sort of a, uh, to use that as an example of, to be inspired by that in terms of content marketing and, and, and content strategy, where you're not just telling people what you want them to hear because it aligns with your business interests, but you're finding things, and I don't expect folks to do FOIA or public records requests, but you're finding yeah. things that are really valuable out there that people would not have known otherwise. And um, I think there's a lot of value on the research side of things. I think a lot of people probably spend a lot of time crafting the writing, but if the information that you have isn't exclusive or unique or really valuable, it doesn't really matter how well you write it or how great your headline is. You know, sure, you might get somebody to click through with a fantastic headline from Twitter the first time, but are you going to get them to subscribe to your email newsletter so they get every other thing that you get? I mean, and, and we didn't even get into this. You've got the mm -hmm. entire social landscape where our, our readers are not actually our customers. They're not, you know, Facebook has our log of readers in our people who favored our page. Twitter has our log of readers in terms of our people who follow us on, on Twitter. We really think a lot about email and making sure, yeah. because those are the addresses we have. And that's, that's our relationship in a variety of ways. So that, well, no, but that seems to be a truism among all marketers yes. these days is like, as soon as you get them out of those other ecosystems, get their email address and yes. build that individual relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's something and we think a lot about. So I guess those are my yeah. two things. Okay. Uh, use and find authentic information that's valuable and then make sure you have a direct relationship in one way or another with the person who's coming to your site. Got it. Those are great, great, great place to end there. Well, thanks so much, Todd. This has been great. That's I appreciate my you taking the time. Thank you, Larry. Thanks. Thank you for listening. Tune in next week for another content strategy interview.